Welcome to Flow Stars, candid conversations between Dr. Peter O'Toole and the big hitters of flow cytometry. Brought to you by Beckman Coulter at Bite Size Bio. Hi, today on Flow Stars, I'm joined by Grace Janowski from the Queensland Institute of Medical Research, and we discuss why understanding the theory behind instruments is so important. It's true, you really need to understand the fundamentals of flow to, to you know, to get good results. Her favourite hobby of skiing. Yeah, somewhere where there's snow. You know, Swiss Alps would be nice. Is there a cytometry lab in the Swiss Alps somewhere? Being an Australian, living in London. I, I enjoyed my time in London at the um, at the Maudsley. The team where I worked at the, at the Maudsley just embraced me. And her impressive determination. I think that's what makes that I had that drive in me that if, if I have to do something, then I will find a way to, to achieve it. All in this episode of Flow Stars. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York, and today I'm joined on by Grace Chinowski from QAMR, Berghofer Medical Research Institute in Brisbane, Australia. That's a mouthful. Welcome to Flow Stars, Grace. How are you? Thank you, Peter. Good to be on board. And thank you so much for your kind invitation. No, thank you for inviting us. I, I, I was thinking you must be one of the best known flow cytometrists down in Australia. One of, I'm not going to disable you. Yeah, I've been around for a while, I guess. Um, yeah, when did I first start? Well, in the 80s, so yeah, a while ago. And I just got really active um, in the, with the society, so everyone got to know me. That, that's a good point. Let's start there then. You say you, you got active in the 1980s. Now, I didn't even know what a flow cytometer was in the 80s. I was so naive in my early career. So what was your first flow cytometer then and where was it? Um, so we had, oh, it was the old ortho 50, ortho 50 um, with the good old PDP 11 computer. We had these massive, huge round discs and I can't remember how much we we could store on them, it was just minimal. Um, and the Institute also couldn't afford to buy an, uh, another instrument, another analyzer, um, so they built one. So we built our own, called the Seeker Cancer Institute Cell Analyzer. Um, this was back at Peter McCallum in Melbourne. So yeah, some of the um, engineers at work, uh, it was just before my time, but I got to play on that one as well. And I think they used um, the Cicero software, which then went on to um, the Cicero software was then used for with by Cytomation to um, to run the MoFlow, the, the early MoFlows. Oh, the MoFlows, yes. So, did you have one of the early MoFlows? One of the what, what's now? I did have. I used to work as a, a, the service engineer as well when I was on maternity leave for Cytomation back then. Um, so, yeah, I got to play on the MoFlows a fair bit. We had the old legacies, um, which we had to say goodbye to, and now we've just got the XDP. So you didn't get to the Astrios? Um, the Astrios, the, the Astrios is a nice machine, but you don't, you can't pick and choose the lasers that you want and you can't modify as in like the MoFlow, it can't kind of, it's not as modular as the, as the MoFlow. Yeah, so that's interesting actually, because when you talked about building, just before you started, they built their own cytometer, their own analyzer. And as you say, the MoFlows were very modular, very hands-on. In fact, I think you sent, this is probably you. Ah, yes. On that's... an old MoFlow with the, <laughs> what looked like below that you can't see, is all the wiring that used to be able to connect up and re what essentially like those old telephone circuit boards you see in black and white movies. Well, that's exactly what it's like in the background, yeah. So where you have all your, you know, your, your PMTs and you've got your preamps and your amplifiers, you set to join the dots. And if something didn't work, you just pull one cable out and um, just steer it down the other way. Yeah. And it was just so easy to operate. I, well, I, yeah, I, it, I would say from a... From a non-specialist, I would say the Astrios is easier. And so we have an Astrios at York. However, from my perspective, I loved the legacy system because you could, you could sense it, you could feel it, you could hear it. 
you could see where things were not quite right or optimal and you could exactly. take it to the nth degree. But we're specialists. Oh, and, and you know, you know, if something goes wrong with the Astrios, it's it's just too hard to, it can't just open the lid and say, okay, I'm going to try and fix it now. Whereas if something went wrong with the old legacy, you'd think, okay, so it's got to be, you've just, you know, you trace the path from wherever the problem was and just either divert it down the next path or replace that path. I, th I think, I, I, I know people hate using the analogy with cars, but I'm going to anyway. No, I think cars years ago used to be quite interactive, that you could open up the bonnet, you could look at the part, you could work out what was wrong, replace it. I, I couldn't, I'm useless at that, but people could. Whereas now oh, I did. Car, it's almost impossible to diagnose because the computer, again, from, from the driver's perspective, it's so much easier. But from a mechanic's perspective, it, it's so much more difficult. And, and that's where I think technology has gone. So why? Do we not still build our own flow cytometers? Why do we just go straight commercial? Um, because they're a lot more sophisticated now, I guess. Um, the data collection is probably a lot more sophisticated than it used to be. I mean, you've got your, um, your spectral flow cytometers now. So there's just a lot more information being gathered and the MoFlow was semi it wasn't fully digital either so it was sort of um it was a there were some digital components but it was also analog as well whereas I think a lot of the equipment these days is all digital because if we think about microscopy you know there's still a lot of labs that will make their own super resolution microscopes that like they will build their own of course yeah, my lab's full of commercial systems because it's off the shelf, user friendly. But there's still labs wanting to do just that, that degree higher, that, that difference, make a change, try something different. And they're inventing still on their microscopes. And surely there's got to be a market out there for someone to essentially take their cytometer and mod it to, to perform better still and to, to, for specific applications. We, Absolutely, but a lot of it is um, it's, it's sort of software driven and I don't think companies are too keen to, you know, give you the code for, you know, for what they've created unless you have some great collaboration happening with them, which yeah, so not many of us get the opportunity to do. So I guess in the microscopy world, you've got micromanager that you could sort of put almost any bit of electronics into operate and capture and control your light and get your detector signals. Maybe just need micromanager for flow cytometry to encourage people to do some I guess I was, I was also thinking, you know, a lot of the app flow applications when I first started, there was there was a, 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 a much more diverse, um, there were more diverse applications in flow, whereas now a lot most of the flow is immunophenotyping and a lot of it is performed by people, you know, especially in the analysis side, um, in the analysis world, by people who aren't, you know, core flow cytometrists. They're, you know, mainly immunologists. I, I think you're exactly right, actually. I think, I think there's still as many people doing the, the more niche applications. It's yep. just a lot more immunologists now using it for, as a tool, you know, yep. as a very useful, powerful vital tool for their research whereas the, the people doing maybe a bit of bacterial research or plant protoplasts or whichever other side they're looking at are, are, are more niche in the market now because they've become maybe a bit more isolated ah we should need to encourage them we need we need a lab that's doing more so we do we do we do a little bit of that we do bacterial work we do algae work um, so we do look after those people, but the majority is still, majority of our work is still all immunophenotyping. <clears throat> and you still, even when people are doing immunophenotyping, you still need somebody who understands flow, who really understands what the instrument's doing. It's, you know, just because something, you know, you get a, a, a signal doesn't mean that it's true. You really need to understand the fundamentals of flow to, to 
you know, to get good results. So do you think the job has changed a lot from being very tech savvy to now being very reagent savvy? Yes. And I think companies are also, they're trying to ensure, I mean, you know, you're, they're providing kits these days. Um, you know, you buy this kit and, and there's all these internal controls. And then, you know, like for some of the, the TBNK work and, and, you know, some of the clinical reagents, you, I mean, they're trying to make it as foolproof as they can so that people who aren't, flow gurus, you know, that the, the minimise any risks of bad data collection. I think that's an excellent point. I think the reason that there's... I, 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 how many flow cytometers do you have today? You have one, two. We've got six orders. Um, we've got... Oh, Fortessas. How many? Six, seven Fortessas, a couple of Attunes two auroras, um, and then we've got oh, a couple of old cantos. We've got a lyric. We're getting another lyric. Um, what else do we have? I think that's it. It's a lot. And if you go back... A few, it's a few, you, yeah. If you go back 15, 20 years, how many did you have? Um, two Half sources. That. Yeah, a third then, uh, I mean, roughly a third? About four, four or five analyzers, I think, yeah. Yeah, so look at how the market's grown for flow cytometry the last 15, 20 years. And that must be because the companies and the effort they put in to make the reagents and the instruments more user-friendly. Yeah, oh yeah. So the complexity of science questions has gone up exponentially thanks to that. And Oh, thanks to COVID as well. I mean, COVID's helped help flow cytometry expand a little bit. Well, as in bridging into helping do COVID research? As in COVID research and, yeah, you know, especially with um, complex immunophenotyping, you know, there's been a huge expansion in that area thanks to COVID. So how did you get into flow cytometry? Hi. You really want to know? Yeah, go on. Right. So I, my background was neurophysiology. So I, I worked in neurophysiology and I was actually working at the Institute of Psychiatry in London in the neurosurgical unit. You know, um, and so it was the, I worked in the Institute of Psychiatry and I also worked at the Maudsley at the Psychiatric Hospital. And it was a tough gig. I was coming back to Australia and I thought, oh, you know, I'm tired. I, I kind of don't want to deal with sick patients anymore. I, I want to break. And there was this job um, at Peter Mac and they just required somebody, you know, an assistant in flow. And I thought, oh, what is this flow? So I looked it up and it said, oh, you get to play with lasers. And I thought, oh, I've never played with a laser before. That sounds like fun. You know, I've been in... Worked in, in, in theatre, you know, doing corticographies and all of that. And I thought, oh, no, this, this sounds like fun. So I applied for the job. And I don't know whether I pushed it too hard, but I remember I, I came home, came back to Australia from, from the UK and I was illegally parked and I was so nervous that I was going to get booked or my car towed. So they're interviewing me and I said, well, you know, I'd like to know whether you're going to offer me the job or when I can start, please. And my boss uh, you know, after that said, oh, okay. And I said, well, can you, would you like to start next year? And I go, well, it would actually suit me better if I can start, you know, a month earlier, please. Hmm. And he said, oh, okay, all right. And I thought, oh, great. Can, you know, can I go now? And that was it. And I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, he must have thought I was so rude, but I was so scared my car was going to get towed away. It was still there and there was no ticket. So anyway, and that's how I started. Um, and it was a really good place to start learning flow cytometry because we had we had a proper, you know, electrical um, an engineer. So he knew how to build the cytometer. You know, um, we high was just down the road where Frank Batty looked after the, the instruments. So Frank was a really good mentor um really good team so I learned so much and 
I think that's where they started to organise the flow workshops and um, so we used to have flow methods courses and workshops. So I jumped on board and started organising them and it just grew and grew and grew. And I, I still organise the, um, the national flow course and, and workshops here at QIMR. So when I moved up to Brisbane from Melbourne, I continued organising them, got very active with the society, very active with Isaac and here I am. How many years later? Why the move to Brisbane? Ah, because they um, there were quite a few people who moved up from Melbourne. Um, there were some really hot scientists from Wehi who came up to QIMA. They had just built this brand spanking new um, addition to, to the um, institute. Brand, everything was new and they needed a flow cytometer. So they bought a flow cytometer and then they bought a brand new sorter and then they realised it wasn't so easy to run. So then they dangled this really nice juicy carrot and enticed me to come up and I did. So I thought, why not? I'll see what it's like up there and um, then what happened? Oh, then I got married and started a family and then it's just a little bit, you know, you can't move on after that and and I really like QIMI it's a really good place to work so I don't I'm not in any hurry to leave at all and, and I'm looking at the are you, are you at home you're at home no I'm at work you're at work so that's the view out of your office window that I can see so if, for those who are I'll listening, show you can I oh, see if I can move the camera a bit I've actually, I've actually visited your house so I should no, know you see my pretty view it's quite a stunning so at the moment in, in Brisbane it's at, it's night time and you can see the, the city lights, the cars. Oh, I can see you there. Oh, oh it's, I'm doing a terrible job. Do many people jump around like this when they're being interviewed or is it just great that does this? No, 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 no you're not the first who have taken the camera <laughs> off and no. around. No, it's the, yeah, so we have, I have the best city views just out there, but I guess the reflection's not helping. Yeah, really good place to work, really good place to work. So, yeah, no hurry to leave. Yeah, no, a nice climate, friendly place, nice environment yeah, as well. It's a bit so I boring, the climate, though. Sorry? I find it boring, yeah. I like a bit of cold weather and a bit of, um, you know, you seasonal change. So you say you got married, you had a child. So yes. I presume, I, I'm, sorry, I should just point out, I'm not your puppy just here. This is, this oh, is. that's my little Coco. That's, um, so, yeah, that's the two of us um, and my best little friend Coco who was our we had to say goodbye to her but um yeah Yvonne and she's all grown up now she's doing really really well how old is she now uh, she's in her oh, 24 so she's doing she's only what 13 14 there so <laughs> yeah doing really well didn't didn't do science took up um she, she got to commerce economics yeah, she got taller than you then She's a lot taller than me, yes, yeah. And, um, no, she's doing really well. She, um, oh, when she was doing her year 12, her high, end of high school, she did all these, you know, science subjects. She did physics and chemistry. I'm going, yes, she's going to become a scientist. And she said, oh, no, it was just an easy way to get good marks, Mum. So I did all the science subjects, got good marks, and I was never going to become a scientist. I thought, you traitor, you know, you, you Used a ticket to where you are, and then you just said no. Did you say anyway, she's, she's happy? Did you say she's into commerce now? She's doing commerce, yeah. So she's she does data. She's a does data analytics. Um, she's yeah. She um, what do they call those? Um, I can't remember what they're called. Dashboards that you know, live dashboards. So she she. Yeah writes and prepares all of that there. so she's she's pretty switched on she's a good kid so, so she's if, yeah which if you reflect on your career we talked about how you got into place cytometry yeah. but your own career is moving so so yeah I, I started in microscopy and cytometry went on to become director of the larger facilities uh, overarching yeah. all different technologies but you're also manager at the moment of central services is that correct yeah, so um, uh, the general manager for scientific services resigned a few months ago and 
um, he contacted me and asked me if I'd want to sort of take on his role. Um, so I'm in that acting role at the moment. So I'm looking after all, all of um, scientific services at the moment. That's like genomics and the protein productions, the mass specs. So proteomics, metab oh, well, proteomics, not so much, but metabolomics, um, the animal house, um, sample processing, um, PCR, all the DNA sequencing, all the sequencing work, uh, PC3. We've got a PC3 facility. Um, what else is there? Goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, a, it's about 10 different facilities. Uh, and each of these facilities have got their own lab head. They've got their own manager, yeah. Yep, yeah. And, and team below it. How are you finding that? It's only a few months in. But how daunting is it? How is it going? What do you see as the biggest challenges? So, um, the, the, the managers are all fantastic. They're all really good. And, and they're going, we'll do whatever. You know, they're really, um, I get on you know I, I tend to be somebody who talks the talk who who doesn't just uh, I do the walk as well and if I need to get down and and get my hands dirty I'll do it um so they're all being really helpful um a lot of them just manage the facilities on their own and they're quite competent I mean you know I, I manage the flow core um, and and um, Nigel does the imaging side, but you know, very rarely do you need input from anybody. I guess you just need somebody in place to mostly. I think most of the time it's just dealing with a few HR issues here and there, people management, moving, you know, <laughs> recruitment, that that sort of thing. So far, so good. So fancy what take happens? talk to me this time next year. <laughs> So, you, so you, I, I, I presume the vision is you you will carry on in that role and become the not the. I'd actor. like to, yeah. So I guess they, you know, we have to go through a proper process and everything being a government institution, but yeah. And carry on looking at the flow lab. Well, I don't know. See so that that is, I'd have to say goodbye to that, wouldn't I? And that would be tough. That's it. I didn't. You didn't. Nope. So you're managing both. Yep. Um, but but more supporting infrastructure to help support it. I think it's a very difficult thing to step out. If you were to step out of the flow lab and someone else was to come in, yep. um, the, the existing team, oh, you sent me some pictures of your teams. Ah, is, so is this that, was, that was 2000. That's probably, so Paula, who have we got there? So Paula in the middle, she's, she's now retired. And then um, the... Yeah, so there's only the, the three on the left that are still there. So Amanda, Michael, Lucy, and then Nigel, as you know, me and Tan, the two in the middle have gone. So that was, I think, was it 18, 17? The 17 team. Um, yeah, so you said yeah. it's pictures of teams. It's very confusing. Oh, yeah. So that would have been the even earlier one. And, and you look at the, the grey... The hair, look at Nigel and Michael, they joke, they look at the photo and they say, look how good our hair looked and look what you've done to us, Grace. Our hair's gone all grey. Oh, just, just go to the hairdresser and dye it like I do. <laughs> say, say hello to them. But what I was wondering was, you know, when you become, if you were to step out your role of managing the flow lab and if someone else was to come in, how would you manage when the new... In the new person coming in changes things, does things differently. And if your team disagrees with it, won't they come running to you as they the will. Boss? Absolutely, yeah. And that, that's tough. Yes. And that, that's why I didn't want to relinquish that role yet. Yeah, because I, I know, I know. Because I think it's very hard to step completely out. I think I'd need to be even more divorced from the lab to, to enable them to have that freedom because you'd have to give so, that yeah. person freedom yeah. just so, for the minutes wrong but i mean nigel i mean he's the you know he he could probably step up and um you know take on that position um where and somebody else could you know do the flow part um so yeah yeah that that is on my mind a lot i do i do think about how i would 
especially if they do recruit somebody from outside who, you know, and when you're new, you do want to kind of prove yourself and just, you know, put your own up on the place, I guess. Yeah, it's possibly a tougher gig now for that person. You you came in at the start at QAMR for this role. Oh, yeah, and I built this. And, I, and, and, yeah, and people know me. I've been around for a long time, so it'll be, yeah, um, I don't depending think on who they are. Uh, there's not many parachuted in or there's not many examples yet of people being parachuted into an existing well-developed structure because all the infrastructures are of that age where we started when we were young and we, we're still not retiring yet you know yeah. we've got certainly i've got i'm any harm i'm, I'm mid-career come on <laughs> i'm not going anywhere yet and to be blocking those positions at the moment until like yourself if you were to promote up it starts to free up those positions for new people to come in. It's a very different, cha- I think a more difficult challenge for them than it was for us. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and people were, I mean, back then it was a lot, you know, things were a lot simpler when I first started. I mean, you know, we had one colour. I remember we could do two colours and we thought, you know, we're cooking with fire. And, you know, on the old, on the old um, ortho, we never had a log amplifier. It was all linear. Everything was just linear. And then log amplifiers came on the scene. Wow. You know, um, so, and you kind of grew with the technology. You grew, your knowledge grew. So, you know, the knowledge base that you have is, you know, the history is immense. And that, I think that's the hardest thing to replace, you know. Like I've got, you know, some of the new members in the team something will happen and you just think oh well you know 35 years ago this is what what we did and and they just don't have that knowledge they don't have that you know data in the that that we do have i i I, i'm in the lab personally less than i used a lot less than i used to be but there was a problem only recently and and yeah oh yeah i remember seeing this seven eight years ago (laughs) just seen it once and Try this, and it worked. It's like, uh, but they don't happen so often. My, I think my team are now probably getting more expert than I am with it because they're 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 operating it on a daily basis. But again, go back to the old mode flow. You can sense it. The new instruments are harder to to di- when it goes wrong. They're harder to diagnose because you can't yeah. sense it. You can't feel it because it's not as interactive. But you know something's not right, and and it's that gut feeling. Oh. Well, it's not really a gut feeling. It's it's just that all your knowledge banks coming together, thinking, well, this is just something not right here, and I've got to figure it out. But it, it's still every now and again, you know, I've got people that have been doing flow, you know, for for a few decades, and every now and again they'll say, oh, this is broken, you know, what are we going to do? And you walk in and you look and you look and you think, you go, no, it's not that. It's this. You fix that, and we'll be right. And they look at it they'll tweak something and it's fine and you walk out and you go, job done, you know, I've still got it. And that's a good feeling. And, you know, next time that happens to them, they'll go, oh, I know that. <laughs> yeah, I, but, but I would say the same with my team, except usually I only have to walk in the room and the instrument knows to behave. So <laughs> then they go, how do you have that? those too? <laughs> It's one of those and then you close the door and it starts to play up again. Or you call, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I've got to say, it's quite nice now that sometimes you, you go troubleshooting and you call another member of the team, so Graham or Karen, and they walk in and they can do the same. So Because you, you've now got three minds, all with different experiences, and between the three, and, and certainly Graham and Karen are so hands-on with it all the time with the systems that they're very good at yeah, seeing and identifying the problems. As you say, though, with the old mode flow, you could fix it. Uh, with the new systems, they're more di- there's, there's still bits that can be done. You know, they know where to kick it or hit it or uh, no, literally just and, and, broke it gently. They, yes, and they, the companies tend to like to lock things in down now for all these safety issues. Like, you know, I mean, how many how many instruments these days do you align the lasers on? You know, even the, the new sword that's coming out on the, you know, from all companies, um, you don't get to do any of that. 
And and it was just such, you know, just finding that perfect alignment where you'd spend, you know, hours. And it was just such a good feeling where, you know, you could you could align it and get your CVs less to, you know, down to 0.2%, you know. It was a really good feeling. And you don't get to do that anymore. And even I would say the drop delay. So if he's getting, you know, for those who don't know self sorting that well, you can get up to 100,000 droplets forming per second. And knowing exactly where your cell is within that droplet makes a big difference to your percentage recovery and your purity. And, and you, despite all the brilliant software packages out there on all the different manufacturers, when you do it by hand, you can get pretty, you can really maximize that yield. I think the, the automated software has just got a little bit of tolerance, it has to. So it's not always tracking, whereas we could just constantly tweak your amps uh, and, and yeah. keep it bang on. Oh, we've got to stop reminiscing. Great, moving, because <laughs> we are okay. yeah, it's, it's, it's talking too much in detail on this. And you sent me a picture of, I think, what you call the grandfathers, uh, which was this one. Yeah, so, uh, um, um, yeah. I, I, who have we got there? Go on. Oh, we've got Howard, Howard Shapiro, who we sadly said goodbye, had to say goodbye to last year, and Spishek, who we said goodbye to um, as well last year, and Paul, who just comes from down the road, just down the road from Brisbane, from Tenerfield, and Attila. So this, I'm behind the camera, by the way. And, yeah, I have learnt so much from all of them and you know they've all been out to Australia they've all taught at flow courses and workshops that I've run Howard was always you know the last time he came he was he was getting elderly and he turned around and you know things just didn't go to plan because he you know not only did he want to teach but he wanted to do his malaria experiment so we'd be teaching you know during the day and then in the evening we'd have to start doing all these crazy experiments um, with Howard and Brian. We're all tired and then Howard would walk away. He goes, oh, I'm too old for all this. And he'd kind of say a few words and and then he'd say, oh, why don't we order some, you know, dinner, get, you know, get some dinner delivered and then we'd eat and he'd go, right, let's get back into it. And it's like, okay. And then Spishik came and he, he was just, they were all, so so generous with their knowledge um just the generosity of sharing what they knew and not holding back is something that i'll always be grateful for and paul you know paul with the purdue mailing list and you know and all the info he has on his website they're just so generous and without people like that i don't think you know we would be as successful as what we are now well i wouldn't be anyway yeah, I guess trailblazers, not just yep. for cytometry, but trailblazers in linking and networking the cytometry community together yep. uh, and bringing them. So, so we're not loads of fragments all over the world. I would say the flow cytometry is one community, which is probably where Isaac comes in in a big way. Yep. And yeah, you've been a councillor and committee member many times over. Yes, so I um, yeah, did a few tours with Judy. What's your current role in Isaac? Um, my, 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 very, I was on the, I'm on the um, Equity and Diversity and Integration Committee. I was also on um, Cyto Women, but um, as the representative for our region here, but I've passed that on to Helen McGuire, who actually got, elected to council the the um, results of the election came out yesterday so and she got in so that was really good um so and i think it's good to start passing the baton to to you know upcoming young folk as well rather i mean i'm happy to be involved but i think it's important to um and i want to get my team now that we can start traveling overseas again to to become a little bit more active with the international community and, and the networking. I mean, that's the, the, the number one um, attraction as, you know, I mean, you know yourself, every time we go to a, a Cyto Congress, you know, we just meet people and we chat and that's, and, and you just start sharing your ideas and it's just so stimulating to be able to talk to people at your level who 
have got that same passion as you have for, you know, for cytometry and imaging. So, so which, which explains the importance of the cyto as a conference, which for place cytometry, I think is second to none that's out there. But what is your favourite conference? Is it Saito or do you have a regional one that's more? What is your ultimate conference that you want to go to each year? Um, question. Uh, the Saito are the one, I always go to the, the local ones and I get to go, I think I've been to most of the Saito congresses since I started in the um, late 80s. I started going in the late 80s. Um, There is a favourite. Do you have a favourite? I, I, I would probably, yes, I do. Uh, it would probably be a, a microscopy one, which is Elmi, because it's small, well, relatively small. Uh, and it's so good for networking. And actually, I, I, I can thank so many people at Elmi for helping develop my career, because it's been so influential, because it's full of core labs, like Cytos, loads. A lot of the place cytometries there are actually in a core facility or running it and operating in place cytometers. The same for microscopy. Uh, and the companies are so engaging and part of that community. Uh, that's a very special meeting. It's just not as big, which I think actually helps the network inside. So I think I think one of the ones, the, the ones that I did enjoy the most were probably the ones, the ISAC ones earlier on. Um, when before when you know the clinical cytometry and research cytometry are all one where we before that division because you were learning you you were understanding both sides whereas now I mean especially when we we're involved in clinical trials it'd be nice to still be able to attend um, and learn a little bit more about clinical flow as well because I think you know the more knowledge you have even if you're in research just having that better understanding um, and, they were, and they were I mean they were still really big conferences but they have a lot of fun too you know and and you know just the hospitality suites which don't exist anymore but we do have the evenings uh, we have yeah. some really good networking events and, and put on by the various companies some of them yeah. as well yeah so that that is good. So that I think there was a bit of a lull there for a while, but I think that that's picked up again, which is really good. And yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, I was going to say again, we should thank the various companies for doing those sort of evenings. Oh, absolutely, that's going to bring the networks together. Yeah, uh, and and they, I mean, they get a lot out of it as well because you know we we everyone's so passionate about what they're doing. Um, and, and ideas start to flow and, you know, companies do take those ideas on board and who, who better to get those ideas from than people working on the... Um, yeah, on the ground floor. On the uh, ground floor, yeah. Base of it. Uh, you mentioned how fun they are. What has been the most fun time of your career? If you could go back and relive one, two, one or two years, what was the most fun time that you go back to? Work-wise? Work-wise, I was going to say uni days. Um, I, I enjoyed my time in London at the um, at the Maudsley. It was, um, I, I really, I felt the team where I worked at the, at the Maudsley just embraced me because, you know, I turned up in the UK with my suitcase. I didn't have a job to go to. I thought, oh, well, I'll find a job and... You know, I did find a job. They did give me, you know, I applied for this position that was going there. I started ringing around all the, you know, um, institution, all the um, hospitals in, in London. I got a job and then they said, well, we'll help you. And it was just a really good team of international people that <clears throat> I hit off with and I had a good time there. Um, so, just, Grace, you just, so you didn't have a job when you came to London? No. So what brought you to London? Oh, just an adventure. You just got your suitcase, came to London. Yep. One way ticket. Job. Why not? And you put that as your most fun time. I think I'd have put that as my most stressful time. No. 
no. Well, the first few weeks I was playing tourist and I thought, oh, I suppose I should get a job because, you know, London's not as cheap as I thought it was. Um, and, yeah, I, I just, I guess I had that confidence in myself in that something will eventuate and if it doesn't then I just have to jump on a plane with my tail between my legs and say I failed and I think that's what makes that I had that drive in me that if if I have to do something then I will find a way to to achieve it it's you know there isn't that oh well this is going to be too hard yes it's going to be hard and I'm going to have to put in the hard work and the effort but it's not impossible. It just requires good planning and a bit of, you know, what is it, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration? So if you could have a job anywhere in the world, yeah. where would it be? Oh, somewhere where there's snow. And I moved to Brisbane because I ski. And, and I, I remember when I got the job here, that I said, oh, by the way, um, I have I have a, a, a ski trip planned. So is it okay if I take three weeks off a week after I start? And I said, well, you like skiing, so why do you want to move to Brisbane? And I said, well, you know, it's a really good opportunity here and I could still go down south where there is snow. But, um, yeah, somewhere where there's snow, you know, Swiss Alps would be nice. Uh, so is there a cytometry lab in the Swiss Alps somewhere? Oh, there's cytometry certainly in Switzerland and Austria and France. On, on, the, on the slopes, though? <clears throat> no, probably not on the slopes. <laughs> on the slopes. You don't want your drop delay freezing as it comes down. Uh, <laughs> what about the most <laughs> challenging time? Gone from the fun times. What, what, what's been the most difficult time in your career? Um, challenging time. Probably after I, just after I started here. Um, I, so I knew what, I knew what had to be done for the work generated to be, you know, to have quality. But there was just me. There was nobody else. I was all by myself. So I didn't have anybody to bounce ideas off. So I'd be, you know, I'd be ringing people down in Melbourne, my colleagues down in Melbourne. There wasn't anybody else here who was sorting um so there, there was just me and, and you know the the city was sort of Brisbane and the other institutes were depending on me and I was by myself and I'd be walking working these crazy hours like you know 16 hour days sometimes because I just knew what had to be done to make things work so um and I, I you know I just kept pushing quality of, of work I'm saying well you know we'll have to start again because this just isn't right um, and just establishing that on my own and and but also trying to do everybody's work for them all their sorting for them um, and then trying to train people at the same time so that was challenging and then there was just no money to recruit other people and I said well I, I just can't do this I'm going to burn out um, so I'd, I'd move and I guess because I was so much on my own, there wasn't really a team that I was working with. So trying to do things completely on your own without, you know, having somebody to, to discuss ideas or ways of moving forward. Somebody who understands um, the technology and who understands what you're trying to do. So that was tough. And then Paula, who was the lady in the middle that retired, so Paula... Um, was employed to help me and then it was so, that's when things really started to pick up because um, I did have somebody you know I wasn't completely on my own so I think people who are working in core facilities if you're completely on your own I think it can be a very um, isolating existence and it's good to have at least you know two people you know in, in, a, in a shared facility right if, if you're not part of another group. So that was probably the most challenging part. I, 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 I survived and look. I've got to be slightly careful. I've asked you about the most challenging time you've had, how you've overcome that. We've asked about your thoughts on you know, running a cytometer and people stepping in. I think I've probably just done your, uh, your job interview to become the permanent central services manager. 
<laughs> oh shit! <laughs> I'm going to ask some quick questions, Grace. Okay. Sure. Uh, some quick fire questions. PC or Mac? I prefer a Mac. Ooh. Okay. I so, have a Mac at home, yep. but our institute is very big on PCs. So all the, I mean, you can get a Mac, but the they prefer PCs. Okay. McDonald's so, or Burger King? Neither. Yeah. Oh, no, okay. Hungry Jacks. Okay. I have I gonna, Hungry Jacks. What is your takeaway of choice to Hungry Jacks? The, the commercial here is the burgers are always better at Hungry Jacks. It's true. Okay. <laughs> Good advert for them. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Ah. Beer or wine? Wine. Red or white? Both. <laughs> Not the same thing <laughs> though. Chocolate or cheese? Cheese. I've got to, I'm just going to go back to the wine, red or white. Australian or import? Um, Australian, I think, yeah. I don't know many Australians that, will, that, that they just drink Australian wine. It's like, why would I drink that? Do, do you prefer wine or beer? Oh, wine, I think, mostly. Because yeah. Australian wine is just so, it's got, it's got more guts to it. Whereas a lot of the in, uh, other wines are a bit more kind of wishy-washy, watery, not as intense as the Aussie I, I wines. Some good Californian wines and some good Portuguese wines that are up there right. with the Australian Shiraz, I would say. Shiraz, yes. You'll have to you'll have to come down and um, we'll go to the um, either the Hunter Valley or the um, the Barossa. Yeah, no, or the Kunawara, Kunawara region has got nice wines as well. I just, I've got some Barossa in the uh, in the garage at the moment, actually. Anyway, so yes, I do need to come back down again. Uh, early bird or night owl? Night owl. Book or TV? Definitely. Pardon? Book or TV? Um, bit of both. Bit of both. Okay. Uh, what's the trashiest TV that you will admit to watching? Um... Tricky question, isn't it? I know, I know. Um, I love watching The Big Bag Theory, but that's not trashy, is it? Well, yeah, that's not that trashy. Um, but is, is that your go-to? Is that if you wanted to just chill out and zone out? Big so Bang what Theory. I do, I go, yeah, I, I watch The Big Bang Theory and I just watch it over and over again. Um, and then what other things do I like to watch? Um, oh, some of the tra I know what's trashy the um, the home improvement programs where you know oh, what's that called? There's a US one called um, oh, Lip or Flop or something where they buy a rundown house and you know for X dollars and all these things go wrong when they're trying to um, renovate it. So yeah, I watch that. Okay, that, trashy that, enough. That, that, yeah, that's good trash TV. And what about books? What's your what's your genre? What sort of book do you like to read? Um, I, I tend to I like um, I like fiction that has a, a historical element to it. Um, I don't. I'm not into romance novels or any of that. I like books with a bit of um, you know a bit of. To them, like one of the one of the favourites that I've read recently was um, A Gentleman in Moscow. Have you read that? No. No. So it was, it was just a brilliant. I, I, I like, yeah. So I like books with. Um, I tend to look for books that have, you know, uh, I'm in a well. I was in a book club, and um, one of the the lady that ran it was. Um, she actually ran one of our Mary Ryan bookshops. So a lot of it was um, modern, so books that had just been recently released. And, and yeah, we got to, to read a good, good selection. I'm just trying to think. I had so many good books right there. <laughs> You're great. Grace, what do you do outside of work to relax? Um, I play the cello. Okay. <clears throat> Not very well. I'm just learning. I'm still a beginner complete beginner I've always loved the cello I love the cello 
And um, so I, my daughter, she's quite musical. She, you know, she did music up to year 12. And I thought, oh, I'm going to learn the cello. She said, don't. And the teacher, the closest teacher was around the corner from where we lived. And she was also a teacher at her high school. And she said, don't you dare. You will embarrass me going to her. This is going to be so embarrassing. So I had to wait till she finished high school. And then I went and had my lesson, the, met the teacher at the music store. We bought a cello and I started having lessons. And I'm in a community orchestra now. And we do, you know, do a few charity gigs here and there. Um, yeah, so that's something I enjoy. Um, what, I like the arts, so I subscribe to the ballet okay. um, and, yeah, classical concerts. So, I, you know, I like performing arts. <clears throat> that's pretty, yeah, it, very different to the science as a day job. Oh, absolutely. And then I did start something, but I have dropped the ball here. Um, I didn't want to let the team down, but I started dragon boat racing. Okay. Uh, but it's hard work and I think that I'm the weak link in my team. So I'm thinking twice about whether I'm going to continue or not because I just can't paddle hard enough for us to win um, at our regatta races. But that, does that just not make the rest of the team feel a bit better about themselves? Um, no, they, they're, they're very encouraging, very encouraging. And yeah, so that's great. I, it's hard work. It is really hard work. I'm thinking, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. But they go, keep going, keep going. And you, you just can't let the team down, you know. So, yeah. Sent a picture of that. That would have been quite a good picture. No, don't send me a picture of me doing that. No way. <laughs> <laughs> There's a challenge. If I get one of your team to uh, send yeah, it. If you, want, if you want to do a Google, look for Barden Strings. Um, that's my orchestra. And if, you might get, you might see a pic or two of me playing the cello there. Okay, well, do you know what? It's not just me, is it? It's now everyone who's watching or listening to this. Barden yeah, Strings. And we have, we have some professional people who are, you know, who are really talented, who've played in some of the best orchestras internationally. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're not all amateurs. So, so wait a minute, wait a minute. You're worried about being the weak link in the dragon boat races. Yes. And they just confessed to being a complete novice cello, celloist. And yes. you're playing in an orchestra with some international yeah, but they're yeah, but they but the majority of us, the majority of us are novices. We just need them in the background so we know what we're supposed what we're supposed to sound like, you see. So we listen in, we're thinking, right, I'm gonna sit next to so and so so I can hear how I'm supposed to be playing. So what is your favorite music? What type of music is your oh, favorite? Oh Bach. I love Bach. Bach. Bach, classic Bach. Bach. Okay. Bach sweets, yeah. And what's your favorite film? Oh, favourite film. Where do I start? Did you see Cold War? Oh, you, you know you're going to get a no off me for most of these things. I don't get time to watch uh, it. It was a Polish film um, called, because my background's Polish, as you know. Um, Red Dog. Did you see Red Dog? Oh, you know I haven't seen Red Dog. We talked about because that's... It's an Australian movie. Um, and you, you have to understand Australian humour to get it. And then have you heard of The Castle? Uh, it's another Aussie movie. It's an Aussie classic. It's so you really have to understand Aussie humour to get every second punchline. Okay. Castle, Red Dog. Um, oh, the three colours. I like the three colours. Remember that from way back. Red, white, and blue. You know, you're just making me feel really poorly educated. No, I haven't seen that either. Oh, no, that that was a, a oh. What other movie? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen any movies for ages because they kind of, <clears throat> there's some movies that I want to see now. Um, the Duke, have you seen that? Uh, I want to go I see that. Maybe I'll see that. Movie, but no, I haven't seen it, though. No. Yeah. So maybe this weekend I'll go and see that. <clears throat> so two other film questions, quick answers to it. Oh. Favourite Christmas film? Oh. Good one. Um, 
always say it's a good time of year at Christmas. There's always a go-to film to watch to put you in that. Yeah, Christmas. so yeah, as I said, the sound of music does that come on at Christmas time? No, I'll accept that. That's certainly on at <laughs> Christmas time. No, uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Probably Star Trek. Yeah, is the right answer, I think. <clears throat> you sent me some more pictures, and I, 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 I so there's another one of Howard here. So what's what's? Oh the, yeah. This is the image of Howard yourself and... So the lady on the yeah. right, um, it's very sad. Evelyn LeVu, she was the director of um, clinical, well, of the hospital in, the, in PNG in um, Port Moresby. Um, she sadly died last year as well. So she, I was the go-between. So um, she used to, you know, because PNG has got all four species of malaria. Um, so she was able to try and do some research. She completed a PhD um, here in Brisbane. She, I mean, she was a clinic clinician. So, but her heart and soul was into, you know, helping people in PNG and, you know, especially with malaria and um, HIV. So I um, I used to get together some funds and I'd um, have people coming over from PNG. So we started an initiative try, called Train the Trainer where we were trying to upskill them so they could be self-sufficient um, and she helped facilitate, uh, you know, a lot of that sort of thing. But, yeah, so... Sadly, um, yeah, we said goodbye as well last year. So very, very sad. Um, yeah, so she, she, yeah, she's somebody that I held and will always hold a really high level of respect for, for you know, all her, all that she's done. And this one here. <laughs> he's gone. To Joe Trotter. To Do you know Joe Trotter? No, not personally, no. Um, so what was that for? There's a gift going in one direction or the there other. There is a gift, and it was going to him. I think I go, so every, I think he must have come to teach at one of my courses. He did, he came to teach at one of my courses, and all my faculty, I say thank you. I always give them a little thank you gift. So I think that's what happened there. Yeah, it's a good old Joe. So if you think about it, and you, and you mentioned you know, the fun experiments with Howard uh, on the back end of the courses and the events. Obviously, training is something that you're very passionate about. And you said training the, training the trainer, uh, pass it to enable more places to become more self-sufficient. How important is that side of the wrong team? Very important. Very, very important. Because I think if, if just to maintain data integrity, I mean, you know, you... And all, all the, a lot of the, the team that are, you know, working in, in, the, in the facility, um, they said, gee, I wish I'd known all of this when I was doing my PhD or I wish I'd known this when I worked in another lab. And they, everyone in my team has this great passion to, to try and better themselves, to, to educate themselves. Um, you know, we have online courses. We have facility webinars. So this is something I'm starting, trying to get, going with the other um, core facilities here. We have a educational program. So every, you know, every three weeks there'll be another, you know, you know, new topic on flow. I'm going to try and do that for all the other facilities. Because the more knowledge people have, the better decisions they make and the better their data is. No, I, it's, I, you know. I agree. And it's not just not just internal, but external. So we, we run courses externally as well at York uh, yep. for, for flow cytometry and for confocal microscopy and on behalf of the Royal Microscopical Society as well as our own, our own courses. But it's a dissemination and it's also the increase in the network because people come in their early stages, they then develop to become, you know, in some cases, part of the community. It's such a good way to meet like-minded people as well and help and, and influence and help develop their careers. Oh, absolutely. So, I, um, so the flow courses, I, I have, I have three streams. So, I have the research stream, I have the diagnostic stream. People who are working in pathology labs, the scientists working in, you know, diagnostics, doing diagnostics, and then I have the clinicians as well, because I think it's important 
Um, and I, I work with some of the clinical examiners, um, the Australian clinical examiners, and they come and teach as faculty. I invite, um, you know, people like Brent Wood and um, Alberto Afeo, um, somebody else, Pete, oh, what's his name? I've forgotten from the UK. But, and, and they teach the clinicians. So the clinicians also have a more, a better understanding of, of flow and um, rather than just, you know, getting some numbers or some statistics, you know, they could, they could look at a plot and they can start to, you know, learn a little bit of pattern recognition. So, yeah, there's three streams growing at the one time. I think that sounds dangerous. It means they'll understand not to trust the data. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 st I, I still strongly believe, I mean, there has to be really strict QC in a diagnostic lab, but I still think just because QC passes, you still have to know that something may not be 100% right and you still need to have that expertise to be able to recognise it. Yeah, and I credit to them for being able to interpret even just the numbers that they get yep. off and put it into it and, and be able to petition it. Uh, in that case, we are very nearly up to the hour. I, oh, I, I'm we? desperate to ask you. Fine. I know. <laughs> On a flow cytometer, what is your favourite technique? My favourite techniques? Well, we don't do it anymore, but I used to love chromosome sorting. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yes, but we don't, we don't need that anymore, do we? <clears> so <throat> I used to enjoy doing that. What else do I like doing? Um... That, 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 that's good to go. Yeah. What bad habits do you have? None. <laughs> what bad habits do I have? Um, I do have Denial. some bad habits. Um, what is a bad habit that I have? I'm sure if I asked the team in here, they'd give you a list, uh, you know, a few pages long. Uh, do you know what? They, they can put that on the, uh, on the comments below the... Uh, right. I'll get them to say they could add it. Um, oh, it. Sometimes I'll, um, especially Michael, Michael in my team is just so pedantic and so meticulous about the right order in doing things. And he likes the, and I'll just jump where I think, oh, well, we probably don't need to do that because, you know, I know we don't need to do that. But he, he and I'll sort of jump from one thing to another um, and not, follow every single step that he has outlined that we need to do. Uh, so on, uh, on that note, what is, it, is that one of your pet hates if they have to follow a strict protocol where they can jump? What, you know, what, what are your pet hates in life? Pet hates, um, oh, quite a few. Um, probably having pet hates. I don't know if I should say this now that it's being recorded. <laughs> oh, go on, say it. Um, probably people who don't know what they're doing um, and just going ahead and doing it and not listening to you and you're thinking you're wrong. And, and especially in the flow lab, if you have somebody come, I mean, uh, everybody has to pass a competence test before we let them log on to any instrument. So... But they'll still say, well, I used to do this before. And you go, well, what you were doing was wrong. No, but we used to do it. And I'm going, yeah, but that was wrong. And they still go ahead and do it. That's probably one of my pet hates in the facility. Um, sometimes when management make decisions that you, you think, well, this is going to fall over in a few years, but you have no control over it. So, yeah, that one. You're going to be management. You are management now. So that's you. I know. I know. I know. And, and I, I can't. I feel the responsibility. <laughs> and I can see. Yeah. I think that that that's one. And and you know. And I think also. Um, if you if there's a reason and people explain to you why, um, you're more likely to you think. Well, I don't agree with it, but I'll accept it. It's no. Well, this is the way it was done. This is why I'm doing it. And you think, well, when there's a why, you can sort of think, oh, okay, fair enough. Okay, that's a good answer. And 
do you know, we are actually just beyond the hour mark. So we stop there. So Grace, thank you for joining me today. Everyone who's listened uh, or watched Flow Stars today, thank you very much. You can go thank watch the Robinsons, but Grace, thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Pleasure. You it's too. Nice. Take it up. And uh, yeah, and we cite her women at the moment. Oh no, you just passed that on, haven't you? Uh, so you're no longer on the site of women. Uh, Cite of women, yeah, but they still, I still kept up, you know, I still keep being, they still email me with what's happening. And, you know, Mar Mariella's taken, um, taken over, she's doing a grand job. So they're a really good team. Good luck with a new job. Uh, Thank you hopefully so this much. Is as your interview for that post. And uh, hopefully, invite me over. I need to come over and see I will, you. I will. Well, I've got to have a flow course, but we're still, we're still restricted in numbers in our um, seminar rooms. So we still have to distance, so we can't. It's just all too hard at the moment until they lift all the restrictions here. But we're getting there. It's, you know, you would have heard about Australia's tough line on yeah. COVID. They do indeed. So, Grace, yes. thank you very much for joining me today. Enjoy your day. Thanks. Ciao. Bye. Bye.